Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to take a look at hydrated compounds. Now this picture actually shows quite vividly the difference between a hydrated and an anhydrous compound. So one that has water attached to it, even though it's not in solution, it has water attached to each of the individual um, compounds, and one where it's not hydrated, it's anhydrous, so there's no water included. So for cobalt to chloride, you can actually see there's a quite vivid color change depending on the, uh, the type of compound. So we have three learning goals for today. To identify hydrated compounds from their names and formulas, to determine the name of a hydrated compound from the formula, and to determine the formula of a hydrated compound from its name. So what is a hydrated compound? Well, if we take something like cobalt to chloride, if we just have the anhydrous form, which means there's no water, and this is how we're used to thinking about compounds, then the formula or the I guess the diagram of the formula would be something like this. So one cobalt, two plus with two chlorines with one negative charge. So this is how it would look. However, it can also come in a hydrated form. For example, like this. So here there are six waters attached to the cobalt two chloride. So it actually comes almost as a big group of elements all attached together rather than just the cobalt 2 chloride next to a cobalt 2 chloride next to another one it's actually surrounded in a cage by water and then the next cobalt 2 chloride is surrounded in a cage by water and so on and so forth so all of them are surrounded by water so let's take a look at how we would name these types of compounds so you can pause the video and write the rules down or just go through the diagram with me so you'd start off by writing the name of the compound as you normally would. Now I'm not going to go through the steps for writing the names for ionic and multivalent and polyatomic and so on, all those different types of compounds. You should have already watched the videos on how to do that. If not, I'll put a link in the description box below and go through that, those types of naming before we get to this one. So you'd name the compound as you normally would. And then you're going to write the prefix for how much water they'll be. For the prefixes, we use the ones that are written below, so you should write these down in your notes to make sure that you know what the prefix is for each number. You know what the prefix will be when you look at the formula and you see the number written in front of the water. So it will say, for example, 8 in front of the water, so you know that based on the prefix it will be octa. And then you're going to write the word hydrate. So let's take a look at an example here. So here we have CaCl2, and then we have a dot, 8H2O. So let's start off here with our compound CaCl2. We know from our ionic naming rules that this is calcium chloride. Then we have the 8. The prefix for 8 is octa, so we write octa, and then we write the word hydrate as our final word to indicate that we're dealing with a hydrate. So calcium chloride octahydrate. Let's take a look at another example. Our compound is LiNO3, and from our rules with polyatomic compounds, we know that this is going to be called lithium nitrate. Then we look over at the number in front of the water, which is 3. We know the prefix for 3 is tri, and then we write the word hydrate. So we end up with lithium nitrate trihydrate. Now let's take a look at how you'd write the formulas. Again, you can pause the video and write the rules down, or you can go through the diagram with me. So you'd start off by writing the compound formula as you normally would. Again, I'm not going to go through the rules for how to write the compound formulas. You should know how to do this already. Then you're going to, um, sorry, then you'll write how many of each you need. So you'll write the metal, how many you need, the anion, how many you need. You'll write a dot. And then you'll write the number of waters required and then the, the formula H2O. So you start off with the compound, dot, how many waters you need, and then H2O. So let's take a look at an example here. Iron 2 fluoride tetrahydrate. So we start off with iron as our metal. We know that has a symbol Fe and because it's iron 2, it has a 2 plus charge. The fluorine has a symbol F with a one negative charge. Now in order to figure out the formula, we can use either zero sum or crossing over. If we use zero sum, we know there's a two plus charge on the iron and a one negative on the fluorine, which equals plus one. 
we want this to equal zero. So in order to make it equal zero, we need two of the one negatives to equal zero. So that means we need one of the iron two plus and we need two of the fluoride ions. So we end up with FeF2. Now we would have the same thing with crossing over. Here we write our FeF beside each other. We take the charge on the iron and put it as our subscript for our F and the charge on the fluorine and put it as our subscript for the iron. We don't write subscript one, so we leave it as it is. So we end up with FeF2. Now our next step, we look here and we see tetra is the number. So we write dot four. We can do that on each of these, dot, whoops, dot four. And then we write our H2O for both of those. So that's how we would solve a problem like that. Let's take a look at another example. So cesium carbonate, so we have cesium as our metal, which is CS with a one plus charge, and carbonate, which is our polyatomic anion, CO3 with a two negative charge. So we can use our zero sum method, a one plus charge added to a negative two gives us a negative one charge. But if we had two cesiums, to the carbonate, then we end up with zero, and we're always aiming for zero. So that means we need two cesiums and one carbonate to give us our compound. So we end up with CS2CO3. Now we can find the same answer using crossing over. If we write our CS and our CO3 beside each other, take the charge on the cesium, write it as a subscript for carbonate. We don't write subscript one, so we leave it blank the charge on the carbonate as the subscript for the cesium. So we write that there. So we end up with CS2CO3. Then we look next, we look at the prefix. We see that it's di, which is two. So we write dot two. We do that for each of them. And then the word hydrate tells us that we need to write H2O. So that's how we would solve this type of problem. So let's take another look at our learning goals. Can you identify hydrated compounds from their names and formulas? Can you determine the name of a hydrated compound from its formula? And can you determine the formula of a hydrated compound from its name? If you can, fantastic. If not, please re-watch this video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. Alright, that's all for now. Bye-bye.